But this is pharmacognosy. Chemical ecology is really the idea to study what is the what are the native roles of these compounds. For example, we don't know really what tinin, what is the, the native role for tinin or for morphine. We use morphine as an analgesic, but what is what is the role of morphine in nature? This is a question of chemical ecology. And this can be a source of inspiration for new drugs or for other kind of applications. <laughs> So quickly, what is interesting in chemical ecology, the notion of evolution, evolution that was described by Darwin at the end of the 19th century, the classification, taxonomy, taxonomy, uh, first, the idea was introduced by Linné, Carl Linné from Sweden. For example, Linné described Miriam Oleander, he introduced a binomial name for species and the family name such as Apusinaceae. Other important uh, notions are primary and secondary metabolites, then the notion related to natural products chemistry of polarity, extraction, solvents, genes, so agricoles, glycosides. So this is something that you probably that are familiar to you, but this uh, this notion that you can use for natural product chemistry, pharmacognosy or any kind of chemistry or biochemistry are also valid, of course, in chemical ecology. These are some examples of natural products, in or uh, morphine, that, <coughs> or uh, uh, anthracycline, antibiotics, uh, um, penicillin, that are used already in therapeutics, but before to be used in therapeutics, there are natural products in the nature. And uh, at the bottom, there are two compounds, which are natural products, for the moment, they, don't, uh, they are not used in therapeutic, but they are in the nature as well. The question about that, you see this, uh, this frog, you see that this frog is, has a strong color, and this color indicates a danger. And the danger is called aposematic coloration, aposematic color. And it is very important in chemical ecology, the idea that a color can indicate a danger. For example, we don't know if this frog is, is dangerous. We, we are not sure. Just the idea is that because of the strong color, we think that it is toxic. And this is very common in the nature. The, the idea to, to indicate a danger, real or not, it can be a lure, it can be a, a, fetch, a fake danger, but this color protects this frog as it can protect other other species, like for example, bees and wasps. Everybody knows that the bees and our wasp, I mean, everybody we know as humans, but also other uh, animals like um, like uh, cows or uh, sheep or dogs, they don't eat wasp because the colors indicate a danger. All right, so quickly, the secondary metabolites they have several roles. I will not uh, explain all of them, but the most important is that they can be used to communicate and to protect the, the species that will synthesize them. <coughs> the metabolism is only, only lays on four elements. These four elements, like four bricks, are shikimic and mevalonic acids, the acetate and amino acids. With these four elements and enzymatic equipment, some species can transform primary metabolites into secondary metabolites with dedicated role, dedicated functions. So this is a general view of the metabolism, of the primary metabolism. It starts at the top with the photosynthesis and then from glucose a, a lot of biochemical pathways can occur from these pathways from this primary metabolic pathway you can see here 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 and there our four bricks and from these four bricks other metabolic will start and will give after will provide the secondary metabolites. So this is a very old uh, slide, but I like it because it describes very well the fact that an organism 
in the wild, in the forest, or in a desert, or in the sea, in the ocean, has to fight for survival. It means to find food, to find a mate, to reproduce, and to avoid to be to be to avoid aggressions by predators. This describes what we call ecological niche or bioma. And this bioma is in instable equilibrium. It is there is there are several kinds of stress, and the stress can lead to adaptation of the species, emigration, for example, if the region will become too dry, the species will go to another place which is not so dry, or too hot will go to another place. And the last possibility is the extinction, disparition of the species. This happens, for example, the dinosaurs have, dis they have disappeared, okay, all the species have disappeared or evoluted, but this is generally a normal in the, in the concept of evolution. What is not normal is the way that the man is destroying, we are destroying the environment, we are destroying, we are impairing uh, any a lot of kind of life. This is this is a problem. But the extinction, evolution, this has always happened even before we have started to degrade, to destroy the climate and the biodiversity. So some roles of the secondary metabolites I will just try to, to describe. For example, communication between microorganisms. This is the idea of antibiotics. Antibiotics were uh, the, the, the use of antibiotics have started after observation on a petri dish of interaction between microorganisms. You see this that was uh, I will I will go with that a bit quickly. At the beginning it was just something curious in the laboratory. Someone realized it and Alexander Fleming described it in England. So realize that uh, in a petri dish with Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus uh, aureus and penicillium, as you can see, around the penicillium there is a halo where the when the Staphylococcus cannot develop. And the, the idea was to say why, why the Staphylococcus cannot grow close to the penicillium. This has led to the isolation of penicillin, which is a uh, an antibiotic, as you know, and the idea was this is at the beginning it was just discovered as a communication between penicillium and staphylococcus. The penicillium defends from the staphylococcus and used a compound. At the beginning, they didn't know nothing about the compound, but after isolation, the compound, the st structure, after ten years of 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 work, the compound was. And the structure was described as the penicillin G. Now there are there were some semi-synthetic uh, derivatives, and there are several kinds of uh, penicillin derivatives on the market. Okay, this this was the here you can see how it was at the beginning of the exploitation of antibiotics during the 40s, so uh, al almost 90, 80 to 90 years ago. Okay, it was a very uh, these are old pictures, but. The, the production of antibiotics is has a big change, but it's not completely different than it was from the past. Other kind of antibiotics with completely different scaffold. Here you can see a polypeptide, cyclic polypeptide, which is called tyrotricine, and streptomycin, which has a sugar-like uh, structures. Okay, but they are all antibiotics. Now let's switch to communications between microorganisms but not between them, microorganisms with plants. There are several examples. Generally, the plants can try to fight against microorganisms. And this is mediated by several kinds of compounds called, for example, phytoalexins. Phytoalexins, such as pisatin from the genus Pisum, as you can see here, green peas, they, they are attacked by Sm uh, microscopic mushrooms by uh, uh, kind of uh, of microorganisms that will destroy the leaves and impair 
the photosynthetic process, so it's deleterious to the plant, but the phytoalexins, they help the, the plant to fight against that. And there are several, as you can see here on this screen, with isoflavone structure, which have a strong antimicrobial effect in several species of Fabaceae, like Lupinus, Melilo, or until Pisum species, Lotus, and, and others. And this uh, metabolites, they, they had an evolution during the centuries, during the millenaries, until uh, isoflavan, which are the, more, the most active now, they are encountered in some species which appeared recently in the evolution. There are several other examples. I will not continue with that because my rim only gave me one hour. So I will respect that. This is an example of potatoes. You see potatoes can be also attacked. You can see here the, the, the dark zone, which uh, where the, the mushroom, the mildew, is a special strain of, uh, of uh, moisture that will attack, or mushrooms that will attack the potatoes and the potatoes will defend by using, by synthesizing scopolitin, which is a coumarin, so with an antimicrobial effect. Another example now, we, we, we finished with the microorganisms, is the communication between plants. Because a plant, what is, what is the plant looking for? For sun, for the photosynthetic process. Okay, so the idea is if the plant is looking at the tree is looking for the sun it should grow and it should grow alone to have all the sun for itself if another plant will grow it can be a problem because it will take the sun and with less solar intensity with less light the photosynthetic process will not be so efficient so a possibility that was developed by this kind of plant, which is called a juglans, genus juglans, juglans regia. So it's a nut, walnut in, in English. The walnut, but in Brazil you have several other kinds of nuts. <coughs> Inhibits the germination and the growth of other plants. How it works? When the leaves, the leaves are going on the ground, it contains the leaves, contains the, the compound which is on the left. You see on the left this compound. When they, when they are on the ground, the leaves they are uh, hydrolyzed by glucosidase. The glucosidase are provided by the bacteria which are living on the ground. What happens after the, after hydrolysis of the sugar moiety? The triphenol compound which is in the middle is not stable and will immediately spontaneously oxidize only with the oxy oxygen which is present in the in the air will oxidize and will lead to the juglone the compound on the right the juglone which is a hydroxy naphtokinone derivative which is a very oxidant very strong oxidant and will kill all the other seeds, will inhibit the germination of other seeds around. It means that nothing can germinate and the plant, the one tree, is alone and can take all the light for itself. So this is a tactic that is uh, present, that was described for, uh, for the walnut. There are several other closely related structures that were published with this kind of, uh, of process, with this kind of mechanism leading to a, a quinone derivative. Okay, so this is the quinone. We'll continue with that. So now let's uh, switch with uh, some examples of positive interaction, especially the, the, the most famous positive interaction is the, in the nature is the concept of Pollination, you know, pollen, the pollen is very important. And uh, when we think about pollen, we think about bees or uh, other insects, such as uh, butterflies. But as you can see on this slide, not only insects can 
participate to the pollination, you can see also birds, you can see also mammals like uh, mice or, or bats that can participate to pollination. The pollination is a, is a reward process because why is the bee going to the to the to the flower? The bee is not going, is not flying to the flower for uh, the pollen. The bee has no interest for pollen. The pollen is just interesting for the plant, for the plant species to to fly from one flower to another flower in order to ensure the sex uh, reproduction of the plant, the, 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 to, to, to move the, the pollen from uh, one to another flower. But the point is that why would the, the bee do this job? The bee is doing this job because as a reward, the plant, the flower, proposed to the bee what we call nectar. Nectar is a sweet, is a sweet juice, is a juice with a lot of sugar, a lot of energy, and insect. Also, it is also valid for uh, uh, for birds, of course. They are always looking for energy to fly. The fly means that the, this species they need a lot of energy to fly. And this energy can be found in the in the nectar. So the bee is going to eat the bee or the, the bird are going to the flowers to eat the nectar to drink the, the, this, this sweet juice. And in this, when they take this juice, the pollen will stick on the animals, will stick on the on the hair on the hairy body of the of the bee or will, will stick on the on the bird or on the mice and after when the mice or the bee will go to another flower it will it will uh, it will take the pollen with with, uh, with it from one flower to another so this is the idea the bee takes the the sugar the, the nectar to eat and in the same times it moves it carries it carries the pollen So this is the, the pollen and several uh, species that are involved, several insects, but not only. But the idea is why? How can the insect recognize the a flower and recognize this uh, that, that this is a source of food, of energy? There are two possibilities when you look at a flower, there are two possibilities, the color and the smell. The flowers, they have nice colors and they have also nice smells. These colors, these colors and these smells, they are they have molecular bases, and these molecular bases are ensured by secondary metabolites. If you see these colors, these colors, they are they are the colors of metabolites, and these metabolites can be of several kinds. They can be flavones, like in this almost creamy, creamy white, creamy petals. They can be also yellow or orange. And generally, the orange color is due to the structure of carotenoids. Carotenoids. I think you have a lot of uh, you have a very good speech yesterday about carotenoids applications by uh, by my friend Laurent from La Rochelle. Uh, but carotenoids uh, are, can be used in uh, some uh, cancer chemotherapy, but carotenoids are natural products and their first role is to give colors to petals in order, at, among others, to attract insects for pollination. So orange flowers are due to the presence of carotenoids. And there are other flowers like red due to the presence of these derivatives, which are anthocyanins, well, we can call them also cyanidin compounds, they are a kind of flavonoids, but completely aromatics. And uh, depending, as you can see here, look at the at the scaffold, at the chemical structure, and look especially on the on the right. You see one phenol group on the bin, on the benzene ring. On this one, you can see three benzene 
uh, three phenol groups on the benzene ring, and what what happens when there are additional phenolic on this ring? The color of the compound change from red in this case with one phenol to blue purple with three phenols. So it means that by by adding phenol group, the color change, the color of the compound change, and the color of the flower of the petals which contain this compound, they change. Another example is this very beautiful, almost, uh, we say in French, Bordeaux uh, tulip, which, is, uh, which has a lot of, of, sorry, a lot of flowers. And the last possibility, well, another possibility, is this green flowers. And the green color in the nature is, of course, mediated by chlorophyll. So, this uh, chlorophyll can also color leaves, but they can also color petals. <coughs> Sorry. So this is these are compounds that gives color to the flowers. Another possibility, as we said, for the for the flowers to attract the insect is the smell, and the smells. The smell, the smells of flowers are mediated by volatile compounds because a smell, it means to be efficient, should attract from a long distance, should be, it should smell good from far. So the compounds have to be volatile, should go, should, uh, they should be able to, to switch from solid to, uh, or to li from liquid inside the petals to gas phase. And for that, they should have a uh, small structure, I mean, they are small compounds, low molecular weight, with low polarity. As you can see here, they are small compounds, 10 or 15 uh, carbon atoms maximum, with at maximum one, one alcohol group. So they are non-polar, and they are quite volatile. They, are, they, are, they have small molecular weight. And here you can recognize compounds from lemon, limonene, from geranium, geranium, and other like uh, vanillin from uh, vanilla. This, they give a, a nice smell for us, but there, there were some experiments that proved that this nice smell is also a basis to attract pollinators. So pollinators can be attracted by colors or by smell of flowers. Okay, this is another example, but we will not have so much time. Now we will switch for not cooperative, not positive interaction, but for negative or defense, defensive interaction, because uh, in the nature, a plant or an animal can be also a target, can be a prey. And uh, another animal maybe sometimes want to eat them, to, to kill and to eat, so they have to defend themselves. Generally, this defensive metabolites are more common in plants or in mushrooms because they cannot move, they cannot escape. For example, a fish or a bird, uh, they have wings, birds they have wings, if there is a danger they can, they can escape, they can go further and the, the predator cannot catch them. But for a plant it's not possible to go, to go to move. So they defend with a lot of arsenal of uh, secondary metabolites. One kind of metabolites are nitrogenous metabolites. There are several kinds of nitrogenous metabolites. One example of nitrogenous metabolites are non-proteogenic amino acids. It means that on the left, on the, on the row, on the left row, you can see the normal amino acids, proteogenic amino acids, and on the Right row, you can see the uh, non-proteogenic, and you see that there are tiny differences. For example, on the second line, you see proline with a, a five member rings, including a nitrogen atom, and in the other one, a four member rings. The point is that uh, some plant species they are able to synthesize the I mean the non-proteogenic amino acids, and this is really toxic if uh, herbivorous species like a cow or a sheep will eat. This is very, very toxic 
and it is a way to protect the plant species. So this is for non-cyanogenic, non-proteogenic alkaloids. Now we will switch for uh, another example, which is uh, very common in nature, is the cyanogenesis. It's called a cyanogenesis. It means uh, a system which is able to generate cyanhydric acid. Cyanhydric acid is a very toxic to the mitochondrial chain, so the energy chain for cells, very, very toxic. And how does it occur? As you can see here, some examples with linamarin or lotostralin, there are examples of cyanogenic or cyanogenetic glycosides. Cyanogenic, it means that it can lead to the liberation of cyanhydric acid. What is the mechanism for that? You can see in this, in this uh, species, for example, what is the, the mechanism? It is very easy. You see on the left the, uh, glyco the glucoside, the cyanogenetic glucoside, with in a, in a carb in, on, the on the central carbon, the nitrile group, with the triple bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. Uh, an oxygen linked to the beta D glucose and two other uh, substituents which are not defined in this case because we don't really care for them uh, whatever they are, they are variability, chemodiversity but the important part is the nitrile group and the beta D glucose after uh, action hydrolysis done uh, by the glucosidase it generates in the middle the cyanhydrin. The cyanhydrin is not stable and it will spontaneously rearrange into a carbonyl compound, aldehyde or ketone, sorry, because there is a lack of, of a P in, in the structure, but a carbonyl compound and generation of cyanhydric acid. You see, first, uh, the, this uh, uh, cyanogenetic compound are in the in the plant when an herbivore will eat the plant the beta d glucosidase from the intestinal tract from the bacteria of the intestinal tract will cut the sugar moiety will lead to the cyanhydrin which will give the cyanhydric acid which is a poison okay this is the uh, how it works and this is for example present in a lot of species like uh, almond almond species or any kind of rosacea. We say rosacea are very common in uh, in Europe. Uh, for example, cherry, peach, apricot are rosacea, and they have in the kernel, uh, in the seed, that contains this compound. We don't eat the kernel of uh, peach or cherry, but this is a protection of the kernel. So this is a, these are some examples, and. There are some uh, in uh, in the nature. There are some uh, sorry. There are some examples of, for example, you can see the plant in the middle. The flower contains linamarin. The linamarin is a cyanogenetic compound. But the the caterpillar, the green cater, the caterpillar will eat this linamarin, but will sequester this linamarin without degradation without cutting the glucose moiety it means that it, the caterpillar is able to use the linamarin for itself it will recycle the defense of the flower so it means that the caterpillar is protected by linamarin and it means also that the butterfly after some uh, months a caterpillar will become a butterfly this butterfly is also protected. And as you can see, both caterpillar and the butterfly, they have very strong color, very strong coloration. They have, they exhibit aposematic coloration because they know that they are protected. So they are protected so they can show, don't eat me because of my color, I am dangerous. And why can you see the quail, the, the, like the small chicken on the, on the right? Because the small chicken doesn't eat the caterpillar because it, like, it is like they know that this kind of caterpillar is protective. And it doesn't eat 
and it teach to to the to the children to the small uh, small uh, chicken it, 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 it teach to the to their children not to eat this caterpillar there is a transmission about that so the this is a system with a, like three four components that was described and based on the presence of the synthesis of the cyanogenetic glycosides there are several other examples uh, like that in the, in the nature with the cyanogenic glycoside a lot of variability a lot of chemodiversity so other kind of uh, of uh, toxic compounds, toxic nitrogenous compounds are alkaloids. For example, you can see, oh, sorry. You can see is an anti, uh, antifidant for, for insects. It's like an insecticide synthesized by tobacco, of course. So nicotine is, uh, is active on, uh, on uh, receptors in humans, but not only. I mean, uh, at the beginning, nicotine is not something to intoxicate humans. It is a compound dedicated to protect a plant called tobacco plant against insects. So there are here you can see other examples of alkaloids. I will not insi insist on them. Now we will switch for a special kind of interaction in the nature, which are hormonal interaction. Why are these hormonal based hormone based interaction interesting for the plant which has to defend itself because the hormonal the endocrine is linked to the the hormones are linked to the endocrine system and it works with very small quantities it is active at very low amount for example uh, just think about uh, a, a treatment, an antibiotic treatment. If you go to a pharmacy with a, a prescription of antibiotics, the dose will be approximately one gram for penis, for uh, amoxicillin, one gram two to three times a day, one gram. But uh, for example, uh, for, for, for girls, if you take uh, contraceptive pills, the dose will be in micrograms or maybe sometimes even less, even nanograms. So it means that it will be active with something that is a thousand times less concentrated, thousand times less compound that is necessary, for example, for antibiotics. And this is very important because please have in mind also that all these secondary metabolites, they are coming from primary metabolites. So for the plant or whatever that synthesizes this metabolite, it has a cost. It means that the, the, the metabolism has to be impaired in order to, to, make, to synthesize the secondary metabolites. And the less, the less uh, compound, the less primary metabolite it used, the best it is for the plant. Okay, so it is, it is uh, very important to use uh, less compound as less compound as possible and this is what is done with the hormone interactions for example there are examples of interaction between plants and insects insects they need they, they, they need hormone for the malt process for example to, to, to switch from a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly this is controlled by hormones in insect in the caterpillar and, and after okay and there are some these caterpillar they they are feeding on plant they eat the plant they eat the leaves but some plants they defend they defend how they defend because they synthesize compounds like cicasterone which are close to the insect hormones here you can see exodone and hydroxy exodone there, there the, these compounds are insect hormones and at the top you can see cicasterone cicasterone is synthesized by the cicas which is the the plant on the which looks a bit like a palm tree the cicasterone is synthesized and it means that if the insect the cockroach will eat will try to eat the cicas leaves it will eat a lot of cicasterone and it will 
cause a disequilibration, a disequilibrium in the hormone system, in the endocrine system of the insect, and the insect will either die or will not be able to reproduce. So this is a defense of the cicas, of the plant, and this defense is using the endocrine system of, of the insect. Okay? You have also another example, is the example of, for example, here is, sorry, we cannot see, see it anymore, the taxus. Taxus is this plant with the, with the red uh, fruit, with the red part, you see, uh, at, the, at the bottom, in the center, and uh, taxus, general taxus compounds, like uh, taxol is used to, in, in chemotherapy, anti-cancer chemotherapy, but the taxus also synthesize exon-like compounds and in order to defend against predators, against insects. So, there are other examples like that, but I will now not to be too long because my aim will kill me. Okay, so these hormone interactions, of course, are valid between plant and insect for plant to defend against insect, but also against mammals. For example, you see here the the, the sham of the trifolium. Trifolium is rich in isoflavones, and these isoflavones they have also uh, estrogen activity, estrogenic, so they can disequilibrate the endocrine system of, for example, uh, sheep and the female, if the female will eat too much trifolium, it will not, it will disequilibrate the, the endocrine system, the hormone system, and it will not be able to, uh, to, to, to make babies normally, okay, so this is also uh, something that it has to be the, the shepherd, for example, has to pay attention not to to put the, the animals in a, not in, in a field with a lot of trifolium because it can impair the the fertility of the of the feedstock. Okay, so there are other kind of examples, but. I will not uh, describe them now because we don't have time. This is only an introduction to uh, introduction to the to chemical ecology. Just now, I will switch with a, a, a last example, one or two last example, if it is uh, all right. Uh, Myrin, you tell me on uh, on WhatsApp if it is uh, all right to you. If I have five minutes, five more minutes remaining. So this is. Do you know this fish? So this fish is living in the Pacific Ocean and it is protected first uh, because of the color. It looks like, more or less, it looks like the, 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 the sandy soil of the ocean. But in this Pacific Ocean, what can be, what can happen, what is present? Sharks, big and dangerous white sharks. <laughs> and uh, so the shark can eat this this fish, but this fish is protected not only because of the color looks like uh, the 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 ocean, the soil of the ocean. It is also protected by this compound, like you can see, pavoninin compounds. They are glycosides, which are able to diffuse in the water, in the sea water. They will diffuse and they will, uh, they are toxic to the shark, they are toxic to the heart function, to the cardiac function, myocardial function of the shark. So the idea is that the shark cannot even attack them, and the uh, research team have, uh, have found the, the molecular basis, they don't attack these fish, not only because they don't see them, they can, they can smell them, but they are protected, this, shark, this fish is protected by this compound because it is in the water, the diffusion it is a net a glycoside, it can easily diffuse in the water, it is soluble in water. 
And the idea is to use is to use this in order, for example, to protect scuba divers. To use this kind of compound to spray on the scuba diving uh, jacket and to protect scuba divers against sharks. Okay, another example that I will not describe because uh, after it will be late. I will now show you uh, an example of uh, defense between mammals and between mammals, for example, this this mammals, which smells bad, you know, this uh, from Walt Disney cartoons, they smell bad, but they smell bad because they smell bad because of this. This is called alithiol. Thiol compounds with a with a sulfur atom, they smell very bad. If some of you have worked in a laboratory of chemistry, and if if someone in the laboratory will use sulfur compound, you will understand sulfur compound, they smell very bad. And uh, they smell a bit li li like farting. But the point is not only the bad smell, they defend from attack by wild dogs or coyotes, which are living in the same uh, place, in the same the North America, they defend himself because this alithiol can make uh, can uh, attack the nose of the wild dog, the, the nose of the wolf, the nose of the fox, which is a predator of this uh, of this animal, and uh, this can make nucleophilic uh, nucleophilic attack on the nose, and the nose is a very important organ for fox or for dogs. So that's the reason why. Uh, this compound is really toxic and smells bad. This is also uh, an interesting point is uh, in um, compounds which are used by species who have a territory. They, de they define a territory. So, for example, fox, but it is also valid for a lot of species in the nature. Generally, the male, the male will, uh, will put a, a, a compound on trees around a small territory and in order to, to to advertise, in order to say, this is my territory. It means to other male don't come to this territory and it means to female, you can come to this territory and you will be mine. This is the general idea uh, of this uh, of this kind of interactions. And these, the, these compounds are, as you see, small compounds, they are volatile compounds because they should smell in order to indicate to other uh, specimens like other male or other female, they, they should indicate here there is the, this, this territory is still mine. It is not an open territory. It is, it is my place. The idea was to use this kind of identified molecules, identified compound for another purpose. You know that mice are a big problem, can be a big problem for the in the in the nature. They can be a big problem, uh, not only in the nature, in uh, close to the to the food uh, food stockage, food uh, food reserve, because they destroy. They can eat everything, and the idea is to find a repellent for mice. So there are some chemical repellents that will intoxicate the mice and will cause uh, uh, hemorrhagia in the, in the mice. But the, some experiments were done and this experiment shows that the mice, they recognize the molecules linked to the fox. You know that mice are praise fox. The fox can eat the mice, will eat the mice if it can find the mice, or a cat, but but generally the fox will can eat the mice. And the mice they have the ability to recognize these, these molecules. And when they recognize these molecules, of course they escape, they go away in order not to be uh, not to be eaten, not to be killed. This is the point, this is why some teams have developed some uh, some compounds, some repellents based on the on the molecular, on the molecules uh, secreted by the fox, in order just to, to create a, a, a spray based on natural product, uh, in order to to remove mice from uh, from the food stockage storage. 
Okay, so I think now more or less it's a, it's a time to, so I will not present that because it will be too long. It's time for, for me to let go to, 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 to eat or to have a coffee or to another conference. Uh, so, just have in mind, uh, if, you, if you are interested with chemical ecology generally, there are very easy articles to read in uh, several news, uh, in several uh, uh, publications, several journal, journals, such as Journal of Chemical Ecology, Biochemical Systematics and Ecology, also Journal of Natural Products, Phytochemistry. The, the, you can read, you can find some articles. Also, Toxicon is also a good uh, journal for that and uh, where you can read several descriptions of uh, interactions uh, in the nature described by a teacher specialist of, uh, of this field. So it is interesting also because it is linked to the general, general chemical knowledge such as uh, plant or plant extraction, um, metabolites isolation and the structure determination. And after that, the idea is uh, what kind of interaction? Is it a defensive, is it a positive? So I strongly suggest uh, to, to make your own uh, scientific uh, to work, to, uh, sorry, to upgrade your scientific knowledge in this field by reading such, uh, such articles, such periodic. Now, thank you very much, Obrigado, for your, for your kind of attention, of course, Thanks a lot to to my dear friend uh, Mayrin who proposed me to, to to be with you today, and of course, uh, best greetings, best regards to uh, my friends Lucindo, Walter, and um, uh, many other like uh, my friend Cavalcante and many other uh, from the University of Sergipe in in Aracaju.